Hey guys, my name's Simon. I'm the CEO of the Loki Project. I'm here to talk to you today about a very big topic um, that covers many, many things. Uh, the subtle art of giving a fuck about privacy. In particular, I want to talk about secure messaging. We hear a lot about secure messaging. Uh, we do messaging every day. Um, and it is important shit, but why? I want to talk a little bit about secure messaging and the apps that you normally use and the environment in which we find ourselves in 2020. Um, a little bit about me, a little bit about what we do. Um, we work on a variety of decentralized technologies. As Rich said, we are a open source software foundation based here in Melbourne. We've been operating for about two years now. And we've been working really, really hard towards an app launch for Session, which is the one on the left there, which literally came out today. The stars have aligned, it's all happening now. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go through the talk, but um, really exciting product. We also have LokiNet, which is a new type of onion routing service, and the Loki blockchain, which has an anonymous cryptocurrency. You can stand it instantly and various other things. But today, what I really want to talk about is conversations. So we've been having conversations online now in various shapes and forms for the last 10, 15, 20 years, depending on how you what, what you classify as messaging. And it's gone from everything with bickering about cleaning up the kitchen, to memes, to organizing drinks with the squad. That's a very 23-year-old thing to say, I'm aware, but you know, it's, it's a thing that we do. Or you can tell your mom that you love her, everyone does that or should do that anyway, or your dad or whatever. But it's gone way beyond that because these services that we rely on are now so reliable and so efficient that we're starting to fold all of these really, really important conversations that we have throughout our lives onto online platforms. So we're now having major legal conversations. We're talking with doctors and lawyers and journalists and activists and a variety of other people in times both good and bad about a very large number of things. Every conflict that we have, every conversation that we have, every issue that we deal with in our day-to-day -day lives ends up online somehow. And they all go into three things, which are texts, calls, and emails. So when people have conversations. You know, if I walk into a room with someone, I expect that when I sit down, it'll just be me and them privy to that conversation. I don't know how many people have read 1984 here by George Orwell, but that is less so about totalitarianism and less so about bureaucracy as much as it is about the idea of the panopticon. It's the idea that because you know that you're being listened to, you change the way you speak, you change the way you think, you filter what you can say, and that means that we're not actually able to have authentic conversations like we always have as human beings. So that's a real issue. So we expect that Alice and Bob, by the way, Alice and Bob are like a bit of a trope in the security paper world. Like if you want to send a message to someone, the first person is always Alice and the second person is always Bob. I don't know why that is. It's just how it is, all right? So Alice wants to send a message to Bob, have a conversation with Bob. But as I'll demonstrate, the internet is extremely good at leaking information about who you're talking to and what you're saying. I bet you've had a conversation with Facebook Messenger or, or one of these apps in the past where you've said something in the Messenger or you've even sent a voice message or something like that and then the very next day you get tons and tons of ads about that very thing and it's a bit spooky. Um, but I'll show that there goes much more beyond that. There's every app out there, like, you know, these are very common ones that we use, Instagram, SMS, Snapchat, LinkedIn, email, all of these different ones. There's many, many more. You know, you probably used five today because that's how things work in 2020. I can abstract all of these down into a, into a single idea. This idea is Charlie. Charlie is the centralized service provider. Now, Charlie's a nice guy. He seems legit. He's been providing us with reliable services for 10, 20, five years, one year, whatever the case happens to be. He's been around, Alice sends a message to Charlie, so then Bob can go get that message. And that seems to work pretty well, it's great. However, there's a bit more to it than that, because Charlie, he's, he's not by himself there, he's got relationships to deal with. There's other guys in the room, like a Donald, or a Mark, or a Jeff, or you know, so for example, in Charlie's case, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's take Instagram, right? So Charlie, um, he, he lives in Donald's neighborhood and he's kind of got to do what Donald says because Donald's a very powerful guy and he usually gets his way. And Charlie also works for Mark, who's got his own commercial interests to look after. He's got things that he needs to do, things that he needs to make happen. He can make Charlie do that because he owns Charlie. So that's just how it works. And you can abstract this away to all sorts of different apps in all sorts of different places. You know, you might replace Donald with a she, or you might replace Donald with a Vlad or whatever it is. Um, there are a lot of different people in the room when you're using any of these services, and that, that's what Charlie is. The next problem, though, is that you're not actually just talking to Charlie. You've also got Tony from Telstra. 
you've got Vince from Verizon, you've got all these people that are providing access to the internet, they're providing the, the, the service which connects Alice to Charlie, who then connects to Vince, who then connects to Bob. And all of a sudden, and, and you know, Tony and Vince, they also have a relationship with Donald or Mark or whoever else it is. As you can see, the room's getting quite crowded. Internet service providers, by the way, are universally required to keep a record of every connection that you make on the internet, be that through your phone, through your home connection, work connection, whatever it is, for two years, every connection you make, two years in this country, they have a record of that. So that's kind of problematic, but it still gets worse because what happens when Alice wants to actually talk to Bob? So you've got a service provider, let's say WhatsApp, for instance, um, and we need some way to identif identify Bob. We need a way that Alice can go, oh yeah, I've got Bob's contact details. What are his contact details? Of course, they're phone numbers, which we've been using for a very, very long time. But because of that, we use them all the time. And that means they end up in a lot of these, a lot of databases. Your phone contact list gets uploaded to Google, gets uploaded to Apple, and that website that you bought an umbrella from three years ago got hacked at some point, and then your phone number ended up in some database somewhere, and then that got sold onto some other guy, and now all of a sudden your phone number is literally everywhere, along with your personal details such as your address, your email address, and it can all be correlated and find out exactly who you are, where you live, how old you are, all of this information. These databases are everywhere. Mark's got them, Donald's got them, Vlad's got them, she's got them. Jeff has got them, everyone's got them. Everyone can work out who Alice is just by her phone number. So if they see that, if Charlie sees that Alice is messaging Bob on WhatsApp, for instance, you can very quickly work out exactly who was talking to who. This is a very crowded room to have a conversation that was just supposed to be Alice and Bob. And we're having all of these conversations in it. The military's doing it, commercial confidential people that are trying to do business are doing it, lawyers are doing it, doctors are doing it. All these people that should really know better are having these conversations where literally thousands of people on earth could be privy to these conversations if they wanted to be. And that's a problem. So how do we get back to this? How do we get back to just Alice and Bob? How can we just have a normal damn conversation when there's not so many people around? We need to go from the system that is trusted. All these people in the room here, that room, that's the room I'm looking for, um, they need to be trusted with this information. They need to be trusted with the message history because Charlie holds on to that forever. Uh, Tony needs to be trusted with the, with the records that he's been given. Um, Tony and Mark and Donald and all of these people are all in the same boat. They all need to be trusted. So how can we go from a system where we don't have to trust people? That's what trustless means. It means no matter who the service provider is, they literally cannot break your trust because what you do can't be uh, damaged or, or intercepted by them. So trustless is a word that we throw around a lot in the decentralized community because that's what it's all about. People can join the network and it doesn't matter who they are, they won't be able to damage you. They can't be, even if they are malicious, they can't really do anything to you. So this amazing thing happened in secure communications and private messaging in the last 10 years called end-to-end -end encryption. Who's heard of end-to-end -end encryption? Throw your hand up. Yes, nice. So for those that know what it is, thumbs up. Who doesn't know what it is? One person, okay, well. That's, that's really good, I'll, explain, I'll go into it a little bit anyway. End-to-end -end encryption is a really, really simple idea. It is that through some fancy asymmetric encryption, um, Alice can send a message to Bob where literally no one else can read the contents of the message. So we have Alice, boom, message is now encrypted, now only Bob can read it. And that's actually a really good step. That's a huge innovation. But as you can see, the room is still very, very crowded. There's still Donald, there's still Mark, there's still phone number databases, there's still Tony, there's still Vince, there's still Charlie. So really, the very fact that Alice can be, Alice and Bob are talking and a lot of people know about it is still really problematic. So how can we do better than this? How can we start to whittle away at the people in the room such that no one is left and it's just back to being Alice and Bob? Well, what if we get rid of personal identifiers? Let's do that first. So we go from this to this. So we're now starting to pair back. Let's get rid of phone numbers as a personal identifier. Yeah, it's convenient, yeah, it's easy. But at the end of the day, end-to-end -end encryption relies on this fancy thing called asymmetric encryption anyway, and we're just adding phone numbers, which is just leaking more de metadata. So why would we do it? This looks complicated. Who, who knows about asymmetric encryption? You guys seem pretty smart. Yeah, so three or four of you, nice, okay, cool. Um, for everyone else, it's really not that complicated. This looks difficult because it's long and is unreadable basically, but with a QR code, or you can just literally send that to someone, that's an alphanumeric representation of a really, really, really huge number. 
and you can do some mathematical operations with that on a piece of data like a text message or a photo or whatever such that whoever owns this number is the only person that can ever decrypt it. So that's, that's the basis for end-to-end -end encryption and that's the basis for how we in session get rid of personal identifiers. So this is now your session ID. So great, we're back here now. Alice can talk to Bob, the messages are secure. Al we don't necessarily know who Alice and Bob are anymore because they don't have this piece of metadata attached to them anymore, which is really great. But we can do better than that. So how about we start by getting rid of Charlie? We want to eliminate trust here. Charlie's a nice guy. You know, he's been pretty reliable, but we can still do better than this. We do this at Loki with uh, something called the Loki Service Node Network, which is a distributed network of computers. We're ch changing Charlie from one service to provider to thousands of random people out there on the internet who, through staking a cryptocurrency, are able to create a distributed network where we're now fragmenting up the provision of the service. So Alice now sends her message to a random group of service nodes, and then Bob can pull it down from another place and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is quite a complicated system. I'd really like to be able to go into more detail, but I will run out of time, unfortunately, if we start going down this rabbit hole. All you need to know is that there are a very large number of computers out there instead of there being one central provider. And that's good for a couple reasons. One, because no single person has access to all of the information. There's a very, very limited set about what each computer can gain from the different conversations that are taking place over the platform. And it's also harder to shut down as well, because it's not just one service provider. There's now thousands out there, and it's all IP-based, so it becomes a lot harder for a, a Tony from Telstra or a Vince from Verizon to just universally shut it all down unless they have advanced firewall systems, which in this country they never bother with. So, pretty good example. So, we're getting rid of Charlie now. See you, Charlie. We're now here. All right, next step. We can do better than this. Let's get rid of Tony and Vince altogether, because we still got to trust them, because if they, if they decide that they need to get together and maybe Donald and Scott and Mark and all these other people have, uh, can get access to the records that Tony and Vince have because they're around for a while. They can still figure out that Alice is talking to Bob through timing attacks and that sort of thing. And also, they're not protected from the service node network either. There's still a bit of metadata that could be gleaned from service node operators within the network. So let's just get rid of them. Then they're not a problem. How do we do that? We do that through onions. They're a delicious vegetable. They're my favorite in spaghetti bolognese. Um, but we're not here to talk about Italian cuisine. We're here to talk about this, which looks complicated. Um, and it kind of is, but I'll do my best to explain it. Um, bear with me here. This will take one minute. Damn it. Now, this, let's see, handheld microphones. This was a mistake now. OK. So we have a message, right? It's here in the open. We want to be able to send that message across a network without anyone being able to know that it was us that sent it. And we can't trust any of the middle nodes in between. Great. So what we do is, using asymmetric encryption, we get this message and we encrypt it. We pick re three random nodes and with the first node, we encrypt it once, boom. Now only that node can unwrap it and read it. And then we wrap it again in another layer of encryption for the second node. And then we do it for the third node. And now we've got something, if I had more hands, that looks like an onion because it's got layers of encryption at one over the other. That's why it's called onion routing. So now what we do is we pass this bundle of encrypted messages to the first node who unwraps it and then they see on the top that, oh, this needs to go to node one, two, three. So then they pass it to node one, two, three. And then node one, two, three goes, oh, this says, uh, they unwrap it first and then it says, let's pass it to four, five, six. So they pass it to four, five, six. And then they unwrap it and boom, you've got the message all of a sudden. The really, really cool thing about this is that the last node only knows that a message has come from somewhere. The first node only knows that Alice is sending a message to somewhere that they don't know where. And the middle node doesn't really know what's going on at all. So we've built a trustless system for sending information over the internet. Who's heard of the Tor network here? This is, this is how the Tor network works. And we've got a similar system built into our session messaging app so that your message security uh, on the transport layer remains entirely secure in this trustless manner. All right, moving on. That was, who thought that was hard? Does it, are you with me? Do you, do you guys understand that? Was that, oh, yes, nailed it. Okay, cool. So we're going from this now, where Tony and Vince are still hanging out, and there's still Mark and, and Donald hanging out, and there's still information that can be gleaned, and that's not great, to a system where now Tony and Vince have got no idea what's going on. They are clueless. And the service node network is clueless as well. So it means we've gone to this, and then that effectively means that they're not there at all. And then, that also effectively means that we're back to this. Now we've got a system where Alice can just send Bob a damn message. It's not that hard. Well, it is kind of hard. We've been working for 18 months to make an app that can do this. <laughs> oh, 
It's been a big week. We had several delays and lots of other things, but it is finally out. I'll share some details with you about that in a second. But this is just the start of privacy problems. We just talked about one very specific example where someone wants to send a message to someone. Sounds easy, but it's really not that easy. And there are so many services out there that we rely on, on the internet now that share similar problems. And where we're dealing with stuff that actually is sensitive and actually does matter, we shouldn't have to worry about who else is in the damn room. We are always gonna be using text calls and emails now, that is a given. But it's a question of how we do that. And you have to take back control if you wanna have the ability to uh, control who is privy to that conversation, no matter what it is that you're dealing with. It's not about being paranoid. It's not about being conspiratorial. It's not a being about being some libertarian, anti-establishment weirdo. It's just about confidence. It's just about confidence. We're human beings and when we sit in a room, we just want Alice and Bob to be able to have a damn conversation. That's all it's about. So that is pretty much what Session is. That, that's what we're trying to provide. It's a secure messaging app, kind of like WhatsApp, kind of like Signal, except it is far, it go, we go to a much greater length, as, as I've demonstrated today, in terms of protecting your metadata such that you can send messages and not metadata. That's, that's what we're about. Um, as I said, we just launched today, and I would really, really appreciate it if you could just spend, if you could do anything that positively impacts a startup today, here is your opportunity. <laughs> Here's your golden opportunity. Go to getsession.org, download the app for your device, and just rate and review it, even if you think it's shit. I don't care. Just rate and review the damn thing. It really, really helps. And then, of course, if you do like it, you know you can get your friends on it. You can have you know, cool little private conversations and all, all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I was a little bit under, actually, which is surprising. Simon, um, I'm sure you wouldn't mind them taking a minute now to get their phones out and yes. type in that Yes, how URL. about I just stop talking and allow you to assist me greatly. Thank you. Mate, I've, got, I've actually got some questions from the audience yeah, here. You want to take them? Yeah, well, we'll do some questions now. Um, I'm Simon A. Harmon on Twitter as well. If, while you've got your phones out, you can uh, follow me there as well. I'm trying to boost my following as well. <laughs> you know, if you feel like doing that, that's cool as well. But yeah, always happy to take questions. Yeah, let's go good. for it. Is that how you become a CEO at 23 with that? What? By Just get, by working the room By on boosting mass. my Twitter following. Yeah, man, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, uh, one of the questions is, what's the trade-off when our data is no longer a commercial asset? What's the trade-off when our data is no longer a commercial asset? Well, I don't think we wanted our data to be a commercial asset in the first place. I think I'll flip the question back around on you, like, what's the trade-off when our data becomes a commercial asset? And as, we, as I me mentioned before, if you message someone on Facebook Messenger these days, you're very likely to get advertising given the conversation. So, you know, there's just a very small example of how that can backfire rapidly. We're, we're just trying to take things backwards a step. You know, we went from this situation where if you just talk to someone, you sent them a letter or whatever back in the day, you, you could be pretty certain, oh, letters, you know, not very secure, but whatever. Um, back in the day, if you have a conversation with someone, that was the extent of it. And now, and now we've gone to the situation where all of a sudden, all of the data is available to a very large number of people. All we're trying to do is just take that back. So now we can still use the internet, but have things the way they used to be, very simply. I don't know, who, whose question was that? Did I? That was actually mine. I was just getting the ball rolling. Oh, okay. I, I see how that, I see how that works now. Yeah, yeah. There's actually um, a few people, like, I think they believe in the dream, which is great, but they want to know how you're going to make money. That's a really good question. So that comes into the, uh, the Loki blockchain. Uh, who knows about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, that kind of thing? Yeah. Oh, quite a few of you. That's quite cool. Um, so... We have a cryptocurrency called Loki. It's a decentralized way of sending money anonymously. It's a store of value. Um, in the app, you know that session ID that I showed you before? Um, that's really long and complicated. So through the Loki blockchain, you're actually able to register a name in a decentralized way so you can have a username, like I can be Simon123, and I can just tell, hey, message me, I'm Simon123, and it's a lot easier. You have to burn some Loki on the Loki blockchain, and as the Loki Foundation, we are awarded a portion of the service node block reward as time passes. So we are beneficiaries of that as well. That's how we are funded. We are a not-for-profit though, so we're not out here to make squillions. We're just trying to make things a little bit better. Good answer. I think um, I'm about to get wrapped up by the stage manager. Yeah, thumbs up. All right. Um, mate, can I, uh, can I just say congratulations and thank you. That thank was you extremely articulate. Can we have a round of applause for Simon? Yeah.